When my father, Ramses II, reconquered the Sinai Peninsula, he made two things clear. First, our empire is built upon the stone and bronze found there. And second, we must never let it slip from our grasp again. Ramses, son of Setnacht, is yet to cut his lock of youth, yet his martial skill and leadership surpass that of men twice his age. He guards the Sinai Peninsula at my behest, leading his loyal Magi against all who would threaten our people. One such threat descends from the north, where the rebellious Canaanites are a constant thorn in my side. However, Ramses has stamped out their defiance at every turn. He accrues victories with ease, and his pride grows with every triumph. Such arrogance is not unfounded. The boy has wreathed himself in glory, anointing his kopesh in the blood of Egypt's enemies. Yet, I worry for the royalty that runs in his veins. When he inevitably seeks the throne of Egypt, will the gods help him grasp it? I'll he find claims a way to bear to divine myself. favor, and even I cannot deny an air of destiny surrounds him. Perhaps the gods call on young Ramses to match the greatness of his namesake, and one day roll over all of Egypt. Ramses, I'm sure, believes so. When I ascended to the throne of Egypt, I did so as but one of countless sons. Even so, my father, Ramses the Great, was untroubled choosing his heirs. Now I often wonder if his certainty was an illusion. My son, Seti, is a proud and formidable warrior, the very image of a mighty pharaoh to be. I've given him land on the bridge between Lower and Upper Egypt. Should the fires of insurrection ignite there, he would stamp it out with ruthless aggression. Yet I cannot deny his nature is as brutal as his strength. Such recklessness pervades his every action, and he cares nothing for the priests and peasants he will one day rule. I can only hope his marriage to Tausret will soothe his callous rage. His love for her is unquestionable, and her calm wisdom may yet succeed in keeping his temper in check. If only the gods would send me a sign, have I chosen an heir that will bolster our empire's might, leading his people to glory? Or will his arrogance and disregard bring us to ruin and drown all of Egypt in blood? A capable wife has been the boon of any great pharaoh, and there has been no pharaoh greater than my father. He accrued many brides, yet in wisdom and competence, not one of them was the equal of Seti's wife, Tausret. Seti is an exemplary warrior, yet the subtleties of governance continue to elude him. Tausret, however, knows when to use diplomacy with her neighbors and when to stamp out potential rebels. I do not doubt that under her guiding hand, our empire will extend its grip towards the hidden riches in the deserts. She rules over the Nile's first cataract most capably, ushering peace into southern Egypt, once consumed by rebellion. However, should the fortunes of our kingdom begin to wane and my chosen heir Seti fails to lead our people, she would not hesitate to snatch the crown from the hands of the unworthy.
The Viceroy of Kush takes care of Nubian and Kushite territories. He makes sure their minds sustain the wealth of Egypt and keeps the unruly warriors under the Pharaoh's heel. It is a proud and distinguished title bestowed upon worthy men. My son Amen Mess disagrees. I granted him dominion over our lands to the south, full of riches and free for him to barter with or conquer. Yet all I receive in return is bitterness and resentment. The more his wealth and influence grows, the more dangerous he becomes. Amun Mess has no love for his brother Seti and his wife Tausret. He could stake his claim as a prince of Egypt by challenging his brother for the throne. Perhaps it was a mistake to send him so far from my oversight. Or perhaps his fortune is a message from great Amun. Could it be that one day this gold-kissed son of Egypt is destined to trade the title of Viceroy for the divine role of Pharaoh? Canaan is a wild and savage place, filled with the lost and helpless, begging for Egypt's succor. Instead, Egypt's trade suffers raiding and rebellion at the hands of sadistic warlords, eager to spit on my kindness. Now I hear rumor of one more brutal than any other, a rising threat by the name of Irsu. It is said he thrives on disorder and thirsts only for battle. Instead of letting him sack and pillage the southern Canaanite towns that bring him closer to Egypt, perhaps such a beast could be tamed and directed towards the lands of Hatti to the north. He cannot be allowed to gain too much power for his whims may bring him to the heart of Egypt to wreak ravage and ruin upon my throne. The Canaanites to the north are little more than barbarians, desperately clinging to the goodwill of my empire and the trade that Egypt brings to their shores. My liaison bay works to pacify his feral countrymen. Though Canaanite by birth, he's practically Egyptian in his learning and civility. His letters read like poetry, sharing wisdom with eloquence and making him proficient in diplomacy with his neighbors. But I'm no fool. His charming politesse is but the grass that hides a venomous snake poised and ready to strike. Is Bey a gift from the gods, or is he the hidden dagger waiting to be plunged into Egypt's back? Hatri is a weak and broken land, left vanquished by the might of Ramses the Great. Now a dark cloud hangs over Hatti, and the land lies fractured. Shupil Yuma, son of King Tudalia IV, is all that holds Hattusha together, but fate seems set against him. Though he's surrounded by kin, the Hittites are a fickle and treacherous people. Shupil Yuma may be the single exception but the same cannot be said of his neighbors. Lurking far to the south is the most treacherous threat of all, a follower of the stag god who will stop at nothing to see Hattusha crumble. And that is not the only threat that rears its head. Jealous tribes exist in every kingdom, sowing discord at every opportunity. As the Libu rise against Egypt, 
so do the Phrygians rise against Hattusha. All while Chapliuma fights valiantly to save the lives of his people. I, I can sympathize with a ruler who must justice. reclaim his ravaged land, desolate from Kaskian attacks. A man who values peace and diplomacy is a rare thing indeed. One who rules through a firm but fair hand, even more so. The Hittites are lost in darkness, desperately grasping for a way out of their misery. At the heart of that darkness lies the ruler of Tarhuntasha, Kurunta, whose greed, jealousy, and cunning continues to tear Hatti apart. Even though he is heir to High King Muatali, Kurunta was passed over for the throne. His resentment has spurred him to vengeance, and his Hakti neighbors pay the price. Perhaps he can rise to power by rallying the surrounding Hittite lords. Or perhaps he simply feeds on disarray, proving as likely to burn all of Hakti to the ground. The Isle of Cyprus lies near, filled with bronze, ripe for the taking. Kurunta's lust for power may drive him to their shores. And should he seize control of the resources there, he would become a threat to all of Anatolia and possibly Egypt as well. Hatti is already doomed. The Phrygians sharpen their blades, just awaiting the opportunity to carve the land asunder. Yet Kurunta is not one to be ignored, for his vengeance may bring ruin to us all, casting the whole world into the dark. Like us, the Canaanites fear and resent the people of the sea. Such raiders have no guile or mercy. And yet, there is the Peleset, led by the mighty Walwetis, a regal figure, and born to lead. Perhaps he can be reasonable, unlike his savage peers. Rumors speak that the Peleset were driven away from their homeland, while Wetis has sworn to find them a new land to call their own, between the sea of the living and the dead. It is likely Welwetis and his people will be drawn to the wealthy city of Megiddo to settle within its ancient glory. Megiddo will summon its allies for help, leaving undefended cities ripe for the taking. No doubt Welwetis will seize upon this chance. His people's survival in their newfound home depends upon it. While Wetty's expansion will set him against Ramses, the guardian of Sinai. United by determination and strong will, the two might find common ground. Yet, if they come to blows, one must surely perish. While Wetty's may also turn to realms beyond the eastern lake, where petty kings rule fragmented lands, wealthy with the resources he needs dearly. If he wishes to establish control over their bounties, conquest and plunder await. Bey controls the lands to the north. True to his cunning, Bey may stake swiftly against the Peleset, or perhaps reel them in with honeyed words to take advantage of their strength. Determined and strong, while Wetis wants only the best for his people. Yet he will surely leave his mark upon Canaan. He has earned my respect and my fear. 
for he may yet become a threat to Egypt, should the crown become more enticing than mere survival. Hati is a land of misery and misfortune, torn asunder by endless strife and conflict. However, the Hittites' woes will soon multiply as a new threat descends upon them from the sea. Uleus, war chief of the Shardon, leads his war bands on a path of death and destruction, drawing ever closer to the shores of Anatolia. The Sheridan are no strangers in these lands, yet Uleus is unlike any before him. A madman who claims to be a brother of the heathen sun god, Isu. Blasphemy. He would set the world ablaze for glory. His and his brothers. Those who stand in his way will be left among the ashes. Or perhaps they shall raise the earth beside him. Uleus is a bloodthirsty zealot, but he's no fool. Calculating and cunning, he knows his ambitions will earn him countless foes. So he chooses his targets carefully and picks them off one by one. Shopiluma, Hatis great king, will not stand by and let the lands he seeks to unite crumble into fire and ruin at the hand of Uleus. Destiny binds them both in battle. Uleus will also find a fierce enemy in Kurunta, for the Stag Lord also claims divine purpose, proclaiming himself an incarnation of his god. Uleus will seek to raise his stone towers in Anatolia, where he has numerous cities to torch and plunder. Should he succeed, he will be in position to challenge the great king himself. Or perhaps he will turn his fiery gaze toward Egypt, seeking his glory amidst our shining wonders. The Tigris River is a gift from the gods. Its waters nourish a civilization as old as ours. It gave life to many cities, with Ashur among the greatest. The Assyrians are formidable. United, their military prowess matches our own. But like any empire, they face trials both internal and external. This kingdom is rife with opportunists. One such leader, Ninurta Apol Ekur, considers himself superior to others and is seeking Assyria's throne. He must manage his Hittite neighbors, lest they bring his downfall. Yet he is belligerent and prefers war over diplomacy. Trouble comes from within, too. Taking advantage of Ninurta's vulnerability, other Assyrian factions seek to claim territory and prestige at his expense. Expansion has even reached Babylon, a long coveted prize for this warlike empire. However, they couldn't hold the city, famous for its defiance. The Assyrian Empire is under pressure from all directions stretched thin to maintain its dominance and beset by a leadership crisis. This is the perfect time for Ninurta to grab the throne and lead Assyria to glory, or destroy it utterly, should he fail. The 
the city of Babylon, a gem coveted by all throughout its glorious history. Its leader, Adad Shuma Usur, a noble king determined to restore his kingdom to its former splendor, will face daunting obstacles on his way. Relentless Elamite raids press on the Babylonian borders, eyeing the kingdom and its riches with greed. They dream of their own empire. Should their attempt at conquest succeed, they would become a threat to all. Assyrian influence adds to Babylon's precarious situation. The rival empire has no intention of surrendering and seeks to regain its lost lands. Beyond Assyria, the Hittite Empire also looks in Babylon's direction. Mighty Hittite kings have long desired the wealth and treasures of the city. They quietly prepare to launch a war campaign. Lastly, the Canaanite tribes south of Hatti are easily overlooked, but if they reach the Euphrates River, they may wreak havoc across the lands of Sumer and Akkad. The land will not be merciful to the aspiring Babylonian king. He must be cunning in both diplomacy and battle, placating and conquering his numerous foes as the situation best dictates. The great green cradles, once magnificent Nossos. The North Mainland is home to the great Achaeans, as they tell it anyway. But their legacy is not their own in truth. We know them as petty and prideful. Ships and warlust are the sum of their strength. At Mycenae's heart, formidable in his fortress-like palace, sits King Agamemnon. From on high, all he sees is land, his land. Yet the people below chip and tear at it. Agamemnon will not have it. He will humiliate his foes in battle and will enforce his kingship upon them. This he welcomes, just as much as the season's crop and cattle. He will then seek to impose his peculiar sort of unity even further. Across the waters, where Messini has often tried to gain a foothold. Troy has bitter memories of this. It will resist by any means. But others may welcome it. Some lands, though still fractured, have yielded to Achaean advances before. Mycenae will use the opportunity to present itself as a benign, strong sovereign. Any who would serve them might be spurred the tensions and misfortunes growing across the region. The sea lanes of trade and prosperity have long bound our disparate lands together. Though now, I fear Messinians and others may seek to misuse them. In their rush to conquest, who knows how far they could reach? Maybe as far as the shores of my own Kemet. Agamemnon is determined to restore his people's fading luster. He would burnish the bronze of his Messenian domain. He would blind and buffet all who oppose his ambition. His single-mindedness is as sharp as the tip of a spear pointing ever forward. The Great Green's Cove was once the domain of Knossos, a people most agreeable and cultured. But they are gone. A cauldron of turmoil remains. Still, in the face of aggression and duplicity, the Trojans have ever tried to retain their dignity. Their strength is considerable. Their standing, solid. 
Yet their Phrygian neighbors are coarse and belligerent enough to justify Troy's anger. The Trojans have long been loyal to their sovereign, but the past is past. Hatta's grip weakens. Far be it for vulnerable Priam to ever call another ruler father again. Prideful Messenians have usurped the claim to glory once held by Nosos, and they only trade in boasts and blows. Surely Trojans will not give up their treasures because a mere Messenian has brandished a sword and is snarled in their face. No Messenian has mastered the sword and snarl better than Agamemnon. Though king of his own overbearing tribe, he is not content, nor will he ever be. Thracians from the mainland, too, thrive in strife and discontent, and they seem immune to compromise despite Troy's diplomatic skill. Yet Priam must try. Whether it be taming the wild spirit of the Thracians or seeking accord with his sly and fractious brethren in the west of Hatti, Troy is abundant in potential and has long had the means to become mighty. Though it has kept its ambition hidden under subservience, now the opportunity is here. What? What will happen to my kingdom after my soul slips into the eternal lands of the afterlife? <laughs> <laughs> 